Welcome to Skybreak Church. We would love for you to check us out online or on our app to share your story or to support us financially. We know this message is going to bless you and your life. Thanks for joining us. Can we just take a minute and thank God for what he did in 2019? Come on! Wow! By the way, that 950 salvations has gone up because that didn't even account for Christmas Eve and what God's going to do today. Man, I am excited for what God is going to do in 2020. This is just the beginning, I believe, of what God wants to do in Skybreak Church and through Skybreak Church, through us. Come on. How awesome is it that God looks at us in our mess, despite it all, he says, hey, I want to use you to make a difference in your community. I want to use you to make a difference in the world. Come on, Skybreak Church. What can God do through you? Well, my name is Jared Ayers. For those of you who don't know me, and I am just thrilled and honored to be speaking today. Can we just show some honor to our pastors, Pastors Danny and Janet and the Green family? What you experience every Sunday, it might be normal in the sense that we experience it every week, but it is anything but ordinary. It is extraordinary what we get to listen to and hear and be fed every single week. So thank you, Pastors Danny and Janet, for your faithfulness. I am here because of you guys, and I just love this church. I love that today we are coming together as one church body. I'm going to see who's in the audience. Where are my 915ers at that are normally here, 915 service? Okay, so you got to sleep in, feeling pretty good. Where are the 1115ers at that are normally here, second service? All right. And I know we got people traveling and on the road, so thank you to those tuning in online wherever you are. We are so glad you are here today. Well, Christmas is over. How many still have decorations up? Raise your hand. Okay, that's me. How many of you have like December 25th at the end of the day or the next morning, you took your stuff down and there is no residue of Christmas in your house? Raise your hand. See, I, I, I have to have the decorations through January 1st. After January 1st, I can take it down. If you keep your decorations up past January 5th, you're strange. And, um, but we embrace everyone here at Skybreak Church and we're glad you're here. But, um, we had my Christmas uh, with my family yesterday, actually, in Tyler, Texas. And uh, I told my wife before we went, because I had jeans on. I was going to wear jeans, and I was like, you know what? I got to put on my stretchy pants for today. So I wore my basketball shorts. You know the feeling where you just eat so much, and you're like, oh, man, I wish I had some elastic waistband right now. I, uh, I heard a comedian one time, this is not my joke, but he was like, you ever pray to God and ask him to make up for your mistakes? Like, God, bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies Bless this bag of Cheetos and Jumbo Dr. Pepper. Somehow let it nourish me in some way. Change the Cheeto to a carrot stick on the way down. <laughs> but Christmas is over. We can get back to our normal lives. And um, pray for me and my wife. We are running a half marathon because we have no common sense. And um, we actually, we have a 75-minute run today. Yeah, I said 75-minute run. Run. You know how many episodes of The Office I can watch in that? Did I say Office? I meant the Left Behind series, the Bible series. Um, no, but uh, I, I am looking forward to what God is going to do in 2020. And uh, how about the Aggies? Come on, defeating our Big 12 foes. I, um, I was a little nervous, to be honest, at the beginning of the game. We were actually driving to Tyler at that time, so I was listening to it. I was a little nervous, but the Aggies did it, and I'm glad because that was, our, I believe, our first game that we've played the Big 12 since leaving the SEC. So that was phenomenal, great win. And uh, I wish I could say the same about the Cowboys. I'm praying for a miracle because the Cowboys have to win and the Eagles have to lose, and they're playing the Giants, and the Giants are like 4-12 and 12 or something like that. So anyway, um, we, we're going to believe that with God all things are possible. Today, this message, we've been in this series, we've been in this talk talking about hope. Say hope. We've been talking about hope, and today I want to wrap this, this up with another thought about hope. And um, I believe that this message is a challenge. It's to push uh, believers, people who would consider themselves a follower of Christ, is to push you. And it's also to bring hope to you and, and even to the people who maybe, maybe you're new to church. Maybe you've never been or maybe this is something out of the ordinary for you. And 
Uh, you didn't choose to be here. Maybe you drove in for Christmas and your mama was like, hey, it's Sunday. You're coming to church with me. We got any mamas like that in the house? Thank God for praying mamas. Thank God for mamas who bring their kids to church. Um, but we're going to be reading in John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. And uh, I'm going to encourage you just to lean in because I believe that at the end of this message that you will be challenged, but you will also find encouragement and find hope. John 20, 30, 31, it says, Jesus provided far more God-revealing signs than are written down in this book. These are written down so that you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and in the act of believing, have real and eternal life the way he personally revealed it. So this book that we're reading, John, is written by a man named John, and He's like, you ever seen those people that are like, oh, I'm so busy. I don't have time for anything. I'm so, you know what I'm talking about? John's kind of like that. He's like, Jesus did so many things that I don't even have time to put them in the book. The Bible actually says that if a, a book were to record everything that Jesus did, it would take volumes and volumes of books. And so John's saying, Jesus performed so many miracles that there's so many that I can't record them all. But those that are recorded, John says, is so that you will believe and the last part of this verse that I want to dissect today is, is interesting to me. It's going to be our topic of discussion. He says, I have to reveal eternal life in the way that he personally revealed it. So how did Jesus demonstrate how we could have life, how we could have hope? How could we have eternal hope? And that's what I want to talk about today. So the title of my message is The Hope of the World. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for bringing us here today at the 1115. I just pray for every person under the sound of my voice. God, I don't know what people have walked in here with, but you do. You know right where they are, God. And we just thank you that your presence is here. Your spirit is here. God, I pray that you would speak through me uh, to whatever we need to hear, God. Let me say it. And we love you. We trust you. God, be with the Dallas Cowboys today. You are a miracle-working God of miracles. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Y'all chill out. Our culture is obsessed with behind the scenes. You ever notice this? Like, I remember when there was like one reality show on television, like Fear Factor. That was the first one that I remember as a kid. But now, or, or what else was there? There was like uh, Real World, <laughs> Real World. But now there are so many reality TV shows. You got The Bachelor and ladies, I'm sorry to tell you, it's scripted. It's scripted. The Bachelor is script. So there might be some like real stuff. They probably choose the people and all that, but sorry to burst that bubble. The Bachelor scripted. But we have this obsession with behind the scenes. We have Instagram stories, right? You have Snapchat. And y'all know dang well that don't nobody go with the first story they recorded. Y'all laugh because you know it's true. I'm like, hey guys, what's up? Jared here. Oh no, I had a double chin. Hey guys, what's up? <laughs> Hope you're having a Happy Monday morning. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? But we have this obsession with behind the scenes. And one of my wife's and mine, our favorite things to do is to watch bloopers and gag reels of TV shows that we like. For instance, you can go on YouTube and you can watch Seinfeld bloopers. You can watch The Office bloopers. We can sit there and laugh at those all day. Why? Because we are obsessed with what is behind the scenes. And so John, as he writes this book, <clears throat> he's giving us this behind-the-scenes look at the life of Jesus, and he's trying to show us something, and it's something that I believe is very important and is the, the focus of our attention today. You see, John is a bit, he, he's a bit of a diva. You got any diva friends? He, he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. This is a self-proclaimed nickname, the disciple that Jesus loved. You have like Peter in the Bible who's like, you know, cutting off guys' ears and you have Luke, who's a doctor who wrote the book, and he's very methodical. And then you have John, who's a bit of a romantic, and he writes in story form, right? He's like, he's like the Mandalorian. Any Mandalorian? Any Star Wars fans? The Mandalorian of the Bible. It's a story form. And so this book of John picks up post-resurrection. So Jesus has been crucified. He's already lived his life. He's been crucified. He's risen from the dead. And so the purpose of the book of John, and he makes it very clear in this verse, he says, these things are written down so that you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. He is the Son of God. 
and in the act of believing, have real and eternal life in the way he personally revealed it. So how did Jesus reveal to us how we could have hope? How did Jesus reveal to us that we could have life? That's what I want to talk about today. And I want to look at three things specifically. I want to look at the life of Jesus. I want to look at the death of Jesus. And I want to look at the resurrection of Jesus. So let's watch Jesus live. Let's watch Jesus die. And let's watch Jesus rise again. That's about like following Jesus. Following Jesus is a constant reminder of his life, of his death, of his resurrection. Every day we talk about it in church, of his life, his death, and resurrection. That's, that's our core foundational belief system of Christianity is his life, his death, and his resurrection. So we keep our eyes on Jesus, on how he lived, how he died, and how he rose again to give us an example. So let's watch him live. We just celebrated Christmas, and Jesus did not get to this earth as most people think a king should show up to the earth. Like, if a king is going to be born, you think he would be born in a palace, wrapped in some Gucci, <laughs> in a gold-plated bassinet, but he was born a king in a barn, surrounded by animals. And poop. To a poor family, he, he wasn't dressed in fine silk. He was not placed in a crib. No, the Bible says he was placed in a manger. You know what a manger is, right? It's a feeding trough. Animals ate food out of the very thing that Jesus was born into. And he wasn't dressed nicely. The Bible says he was wrapped in rags. And so Jesus wasn't born as we would think a king would be born. And you see we, see, we see very little of him growing up. We know two things. One, he grew up. The Bible says he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with man. Luke 2.52. So we know that Jesus grew up. We also know that he was a carpenter. Joseph, his dad, was a carpenter. And so we can assume that Jesus was a manly man. He probably had some calluses on his hands. And I like to consider myself a manly man. I don't know that, but I like to consider. But I cannot work with, I can't build any, anything. If it has instructions, we're good. If not, we out. Call somebody else. But basically, we don't see much of Jesus until the time he's 30 years old. So all this time has passed. Jesus is now 30. And where do we see him? At a wedding. If you know the story, he's at a wedding. And by the way, he's not there to perform a miracle. He ends up performing one, but that's not why he's there. Jesus is at a wedding, get this, groundbreaking, to hang out. Jesus wanted to be around people, and people wanted to be around Jesus. Let that talk to you, Christian. People wanted to be around Jesus. And so here's the scenario. Jesus is at a wedding, hanging out, enjoying his time, and the wedding party runs out of wine. Crisis. Mary is like, hey, I think my son Jesus can help. Jesus is like, not now, Mom. This is not my time. We ain't ready. Not now. He's like, no, Jesus. So what Jesus does is he turns the water. You know the story. He turns the water into wine. And it's at this point that Jesus' ministry really begins. Let's watch him live. I wish that I could follow Jesus in real life, not like follow him like in the sense that we do today, but literally walk with Jesus because I believe that he would shock and possibly offend many people in this room. You want to know why? Jesus went towards people that others went away from. Children, women, non-Jews. Y'all, racism existed in Jesus' day. It was alive and well. So children... They weren't, they weren't looked highly on in this day. And there's a story in the Bible where Jesus is talking and all these kids are coming up and the disciples are like, hey, this is Jesus, this is, this is God, get out of here. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. Unless you become like a little child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus loved children. Women. There's a scenario where Jesus comes in on this scene and this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now, the act of adultery was punishable by death. You would be stoned if you were caught 
in the act of adultery. So this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And what does Jesus do? The only one who had any right to kill her, to put this woman to death, the only one that had any right to say anything about this woman's sin, he saves her life. Let's watch him live. The Samaritan woman. Jesus goes to a well. This woman is there getting water. It's the heat of the day. She's trying to avoid people. And Jesus is like, hey, girl, give me a drink. And uh, he, she says something. I don't remember what she says. That's not important. But <laughs> it just slipped my mind. But Jesus is like, hey, give me a drink. And it ends up, she's like, oh, I see that you're a prophet. Because Jesus is like, hey, no, you're right. You don't have a husband. You have five husbands. And the man you're with now is not your husband. And she's like, oh, I perceive that you're a prophet. So Jesus goes out of his way to meet a Samaritan woman, a non-Jew. So who is Jesus drawn to? The sick, the broken, and the sinners. By the way, that's everybody in this room. Jesus said himself, I come for sick people. You see, there's a scenario where Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were the religious people, the church leaders, the pastors, if you will, of the day. And so Jesus is dealing with these people. And they're like, hey, why are you hanging out with these people, man? We're the ones that know the Bible. We know the Torah. We're the good people. We're the ones that obey the law. Why are you hanging out with these people? And Jesus says in Mark 2, 17, beautiful passage. He says, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come not to call those who think they are righteous, but those who know that they are sinners. Let's watch them live. Now let's watch them die on a cross made of wood from a tree that he created. Think about it. Remember the beginning of time God spoke into existence the world? On a tree that he created by men that he created. He allowed them to kill him. The Bible says they did not take his life. He gave his life. And he hung, for what we can best tell, for six hours. And a lot of times when we read the Bible story, the crucifixion story, we we water it down a little bit. But the, the reality is he hung there for six hours and he died of suffocation. His lungs filled with blood. Let's watch him die. What does Jesus do? In his last few moments alive, he looks down on these people and he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. First off, they know exactly what they're doing. They were very well trained in execution. So they knew exactly what they were doing. But what Jesus is referring to is they don't realize that they're fulfilling God's plan by putting me on this cross. In his very last moment, he offered words of forgiveness. He forgives those who hurt him. Let's watch him die. By the way, it was our sin, my sin and your sin, that put him there. And the guilt and the shame and the sin, that's what hurt Jesus the most. It wasn't the fact that he had nails in his hands holding him onto the cross or in his feet. It wasn't the fact that he had pierced, he had a pierced side from a spear. It wasn't the fact that he was wearing a crown of thorns as a mockery, humiliation. It was humiliating. It wasn't that that hurt Jesus the most. What hurt Jesus the most was our sin. The Bible says that Jesus took the cup of sin. He became sin for us so that we could be in right standing with God the Father. That's what hurt him the most. Romans 8, verse 1 says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He died for our sin, but not only did he die for our sin, he died so that we don't have to feel shame. You ever wake up and you don't have to raise your hand. You ever wake up feeling regret, feeling dirty, remembering what you did last night. That's why Jesus died. So that we can wake up, the Bible says his mercies are new every single day. So that we can wake up and yeah, I messed up. Yeah, I fell short. Yeah, I made a mistake. But that's not who I am. I am a child of God. I am born again. I am saved by grace on the cross. You are not identified by your sin. Thank God. He died to take that shame. Let's watch him rise again. Through his life, we see 
how to live. Through his death, we learn how to be forgiven and how to forgive. And through his resurrection, we learn how to have hope. We learn how to have eternal life. After the stone was rolled away, by the way, it was a guarded tomb, big rock in front of it, soldiers guarding the tomb. The stone was rolled away. And who does Jesus appear to? Women. People who others looked down on. People who others considered an outcast. By the way, one of those women that Jesus appeared to at first was Mary Magdalene. And I don't have time to go into it, and there are kids in here, but she's got a backstory. Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. She made monies in ways that would have been frowned upon. But Jesus went to her first. If I was Jesus, if I came out of the tomb, I would walk to the people who did this to me and be like, what now? But that's not what Jesus did. Why did he do it this way? Because that's who he is. So if you feel like you're messed up, if you feel like you're unworthy or you're dirty or you're full of shame, full of guilt, you feel like you don't belong, you feel like you're unloved, like you're unforgivable, you are the perfect candidate for Jesus Christ. Why did he appear to a prostitute? Because he loved her. Jesus rose again, get this, not just for church people, not just for do-gooders, for God so loved the world. That word world is translated into bad people, the broken system that we live in. It's not just talking about the planet. It's saying, for God so loved bad people that he gave his only son, that if you would just believe in him, you would not perish but have eternal life. Let's watch him rise again. And while Jesus was rising again, his disciples were locked away in a room, scared, because their Savior was crucified, hung on a cross, and they were afraid that they were next. And so they were in a room, scared, fearful for their lives. And guess what Jesus does? He walks through the wall. There's a locked room. He walks through the wall. So Jesus can go into the places that you have shut. A lot of times, and yeah, we have to open up our heart to God, but sometimes God will show up whether we open up or not to that place in your life that you don't want anyone to know about, to that place in your life that's so dark that you cannot see your hand in front of your face. Jesus will go into those places. And so there's this disciple there who actually, he wasn't in the room at the time. His name is Thomas. Have you ever heard the phrase doubting Thomas? That's where this comes from. So Thomas comes back and like, Thomas, Jesus was here. And he's like, quit playing. Like, no, 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 Thomas. He, he did what he said he would do. Jesus was here. Thomas said, y'all, unless I see the scars in his hands, unless I put my hands on those scars, unless I touch the scar on his side, I will not believe. So guess what Jesus does? Again, goes out of his way to find a doubter. He shows up to Thomas, and he's like, hey, Thomas, it's me. Feel my scars. I can imagine Thomas was like, okay, no, Jesus, you proved your point. Jesus was like, no, no, no. You said you needed proof. Touch it. No, no it's kind of gross. I'm good. Jesus said, no, 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 Thomas, feel my hands. Thomas feels the scars. In John 20, 29, Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed but blessed are those who have seen and not yet believe. You know who that's talking to? It's us. Because he knew that 2,000 years later, on December 29th, 2019, we'd be sitting in a room like this, talking about Jesus. He knew that we would be here. He knew what you would walk through. He knew that you would be here today. You are not here by mistake, no matter what anyone has said. You are here on purpose, for a purpose. And the same Jesus, come on, that walks through walls, 
The same Jesus that forgives the prostitutes and the people who hung him on a cross. The same Jesus that goes out of his way to find the doubter. The same Jesus that heals the sick, the hurting, and the broken. The same Jesus that revealed himself through his life, his death, and his resurrection wants to show himself to you today. He is the hope that we have. He is our savior. He is our peace. He is our friend. He is our advocate. He is our healer. He is our joy. He is the answer. And he is our hope. He's the hope of the world. Watch him live. Watch him die. Watch him rise again. Why? He did it for you. Why does Christmas exist? You. Why? Because God so loved the world that he had to give his son for you. Why did Jesus go to the cross? Because of me. Because of you. Why did he rise again? Because of me. Because of you. Because he wanted to bring you hope. He wanted to bring you life. And so, if you're in the room this morning and you're struggling, you've been looking for hope, like the song says, in all the wrong places, you're not going to find it in that relationship. You're not going to find it in your money. You're not going to find it in your possessions. You're going to find it in a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's what Jesus said. And so the way you're going to find eternal hope is by putting that hope, putting your trust, putting your faith in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in Romans 10, 9 that if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the hope we have, church. It's not how good you think you are, how bad you think you are, what you did even this morning. You ever doubted? Ever felt unworthy? Y'all, I was sitting up here studying for the sermon, and I doubted God's ability to work through me. So you're in good company today if you feel less than. You're in good company today if you feel like you don't measure up. But that's the beauty of the cross of Jesus Christ. None of us could earn it. But Jesus went to the cross, took on sin, took on shame, took on guilt, so that we could have life, so that we could have hope, and that we could have eternal salvation through his name. And so, what a great way to end 2019, to start 2020 with a new walk, a new perspective, a new hope that you can be saved. And so I want everyone, if you would, just to close your eyes and bow your heads. This is the most important part of our service. Everything that we do as a church revolves around this moment right here. I want to give you an invitation, an invitation to accept Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've made that decision before but you've walked away and you know you're not living the way that God intended for you to, or maybe you've never made that decision and you feel that little knock on your heart. The Bible says, if you hear that knock, let him in. That's the Jared translation. Maybe you felt that tug for a while. What a perfect way to end 2019 by making that decision today to accept Jesus into your heart. It doesn't mean all your problems go away, but it means you have hope because you have Jesus. And so, Father, right now, for every person in this room who does not know you, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would tug on their hearts so strong that they can't avoid it. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We cannot earn it. There's nothing that we could do in a million lifetimes to deserve salvation, but yet you give it to us anyway. Why? Because you love us and you want to have a relationship with us. So if that's you, the Bible says, like I said before, if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's all you have to do is believe that. And so I want to pray a prayer, and I want everyone in the room to pray this prayer after me, whether you've prayed it before or not. I just ask that you pray it to support the person on your left and your right. Say, dear Jesus, 
I invite you into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Make me a new person. Thank you for taking away my past. I trust you. I'll follow you for the rest of my life. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, can you just shoot your hand up all over the room? Come on. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? We want to celebrate with you. God bless you. Some of our team is going to tell you what to do next. But I believe that 2020 can be your best year yet. I'm so thankful for what God has done in 2019. I look forward to 2020. Thank you, guys.